this Congress. So we have um, teachers from A Course in Miracles and teachers from the uh, Vedanta tradition, such as Muji himself. You're welcome. Thank, thank, you. thank you for being with us. Thank you. Good. So mm. I'd, maybe I'd just like to start with this topic of these two fields coming together, which the way I see it is non-duality and forgiveness. Mm. And forgiveness is very much uh, an integral practice um, of the course, what we call the course, is the short for A Course in Miracles. And it, I think it's going to be a very valuable experience, especially for, for course students, to hear from an advisor teacher like yourself. So maybe let's just start with forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean to you? And what does it represent in the practice of Advaita? Well, I was open to get my question in and ask you what it means for you, uh, the forgiveness, yes. because sure. when I first heard you know, the expression, you know, it, it obviously was indicating a broader um, meaning than most people would on the surface feel it. Forgiveness is, you know, asking for forgiveness for a wrong done or something like that. And normally it is from person to person or from sometimes a nation also asks forgiveness for another nation or something for acts done in a previous time or even at the current time or something. Mm. But when I heard it in the context that it was expressed, yeah. it felt I wanted to hear from you what is this term because you seem to put it it almost had a, a kind of epic quality to it. So <laughs> I, I think I should be I should ask a question in sure. your in your yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, course. What does what does it mean? Uh, forgiveness. Yeah. Mm. I think you're absolutely right in saying that most people think that forgiveness is this um, almost like I am better than you because you did something wrong and I forgive you because I'm morally superior than you and that's maybe mm. for the most part of the world, how they, they view forgiveness. And that's certainly been something that has been ingrained with a lot of religion. Mm. I'm, I don't, maybe even a bit of a limitation for me. Okay. That, because I think a lot of people in the, the Christian domain as that I am familiar with growing mm. up. So sometimes that could, could forgiveness can be very challenging mm. for them. Mm. If it's really authentic, I'm not talking about politically correct forgiveness. Yeah. But a forgiveness, which is to say, look, you know, you you kill my son, mm. and you took away the light from our life. Mm. But I'm choosing from my heart to forgive you for this action. You know, so it can be also very challenging for people. Yeah. To 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 forgive, you know, like this. Yeah. Mm. Of course, there's the other thing that you mentioned as well that can be there too. But I didn't want to leave out that for many people even so. Forgiveness, you know, is kind of like it's it's a light because it sometimes shows you where you're still, you know, you know, clinging to a deep pain and won't let go of this because you feel you have a right to be angry, you have a right to be sad, you have a right to be to be unforgiving or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on that level, no. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, of course, I paint the, the extreme okay. of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what the course would call true forgiveness, and the course has two separate definitions of forgiveness. One is forgiveness to destroy, which is the forgive forgiveness in the eyes of the ego, how the ego would want to perceive forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the other is true forgiveness, or what the Holy Spirit, the path of the Holy Spirit, the path of spirit, as we say. And how what this true forgiveness is, is really to see innocence. And to deeply realize that there is no separation between individuals. And once you have that paradigm, you see that it's the left hand doing something to the right hand. Mm -hmm. And something that, that interaction, you know, maybe like you said, mm -hmm. someone has killed my son. When you deeply see that unity of all beings, then you realize that that interaction must have occurred because you wanted to be separate from this individual. Mm. And true forgiveness is seeing this construct that you've made and dropping it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So 
first of all, what do you, what do you think of this definition of true forgiveness? Well, like? actually, I, I I heard this now mm -hmm. that from that place where you say you know in the higher consciousness mm -hmm. where it is seen that uh, that we are one. Uh, maybe we vary in expression, but in essence we are one, mm -hmm. one self. Mm -hmm. So therefore, as Papaji would say, if the hand puts food in the mouth, should the mouth say thank you to the hand? Mm. You see? No, it's one thing. So when life is seen with that unicity of being perspective, no? then automatically, automatically, we don't have to even say, I forgive you for doing this, in a sense. It, it, is, it is immediately understood, spontaneously understood, that it is just, there isn't really an individual doing something to another individual, per se, mm -hmm. like that. No? That life becomes somehow like the theater room of consciousness, and something is playing out these roles and so on. And that... There isn't really a person doing something to another person in the deepest and purest insight. Mm -hmm. Although we cannot totally dismiss this, depending on how authentic the position we're looking from is. Because if you, inside your heart, really see that there's a unity of being, that there we are really one, mm -hmm. you really are that, then... You could not survive as you and me survive as me. You understand? If there's really a unity, then where would I see you with any depth of meaning? Mm -hmm. You see, there cannot be you and me when, when we are one. We can say at the superficial level of universal language interaction, we can say, yes, you did this and that but that will be sitting inside a larger consciousness in which it's already established that there's no reality to you and me as independent autonomous entities or something like that. Right. So the paradigm itself changes. The way of seeing changes. The way of seeing has changed then. Uh, the language may continue because mm -hmm. we have to interact and we are still in these bodies and there is still a duality there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a functional duality, mm -hmm. but it is not... Um, it causes no injury, because we see that the duality itself is a play and expression of unicity. Of you understand, it is of unity. Yes, yes, it's like the unity inside the diversity, as you could say, like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of hypocrisy. You're going to be a lot of you saying, "No, we are one. There's no two. There's no... But still, you know, yeah, but you owe me this money. I want my money back. You know, and behind right. the curtains or something, because they haven't." They haven't really assimilated that meaning deep inside their being. They may only be saying that because at a conceptual level, at an intellectual level, they may say, I agree with that, I see that there's, there's, there's only the truth. Mm -hmm. But at the expressed, passionate level of living, they're still carrying the sense of individuality very strongly. So would you say this is almost like being gentle with the other participants in the dream, in Still using that? No, no, because if you're being gentle, there's still something false about it because it's still feeling that. Hmm, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I gathered your meaning exactly. So maybe I give you a bit more space to say that what you. What I understood from you hmm. is that we, pre assuming. I feel like I'm going to mind space here, but I'll just it's say fine. what I'm saying. I feel like what you're saying is if a being has truly realized this concept of unity. He, still operating in the world, has to express himself with dualistic language. As is necessary. Yes. Because there wouldn't be... It's, it's like your, your life is not, is not coming from your mind. Mm -hmm. It is like without, you need absolutely no preparation at all in life. Your life becomes a spontaneous existence. Right. So therefore, if I was meeting someone who I have not met before... I wouldn't have to research anything about them. So when I meet them, something automatically meets at the appropriate level. Because the human uh, instrument, when consciousness manifests or plays as humanity, 
and believes strongly in its human identity. Mm. It's as though it, it appears to separate into this this entity with autonomy who have a feeling like I decide where I'm going in life. This mm -hmm. is my life. This is my private life and whatever. Mm -hmm. So that changes. Right. So that interaction would be spontaneous. Yes. It would just flow. All interactions are, ch are spontaneous. Everything is spontaneous. When the ego, the personal, the person is not there. Mm. Truth is sublimely simple, but the one pursuing truth is very complex. <laughs> Why? Because the whole uh, the whole standpoint of a person is that I decide and make decisions independent of the totality, mm. and that is a massive illusion and delusion also. But why? Because consciousness plays on many different levels. One, it can play as intense identity with the body-mind and believe itself to be, I am the body-mind for a while. Mm -hmm. Everything is for a while. Mm -hmm. Because if consciousness plays as an individual, it will go for a while until that state becomes unbearable. Mm -hmm. Then it is mm, propelled, compelled into change mm -hmm. to go to a more subtle level in order to bear the weight of existence. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a parallel in The Course of Miracles mm -hmm. where it says that, um, well, this is a metaphor, obviously. I mean, yeah, I shall stop using obviously. Um, as The Course describes it, it's a, it's a tiny mad idea that appeared in the mind of Christ that imagined to itself what would it be like for me to go off and play on my own. And that's the the genesis of the ego, to think that it can have a separate existence from the mind of God. And like yes. just as you said, there comes a point where, I think, in, again in the Course it says, uh, tolerance for pain may be high, but it is not without limit. At some point, at every, in every being's existence, there is a point where it is the end of that Cycle there are other ways that. into change and transformation, mm -hmm. but that is one of them. Um, when your life becomes unbearable at the level that you're living conceptually, because that's where unbearableness really is. I mean, there's physical pain, but we're talking very often about the kind of psychological pain, emotional pain, yeah. the pain arising out of egoic projections and thought. Mm -hmm. This is what I say, all beings are compelled into change. They're compelled to evolve um, in consciousness. And I guess I want to bring it here to relationships, mm -hmm. because the Course is, you know, the truths that are expressed in the Course are, are universal truths, mm -hmm. as expressed in Buddhism and Advaita and many of the other great wisdom traditions. But I would say that the course really excels in the, the arena of relationships, hence forgiveness. Uh, do you want to just maybe comment on, on this practice? And do you think it's... Relationships necessarily function in duality, expressions of duality. And they are part of the, what I call the expression of dynamic consciousness, which I mean the consciousness which manifests as multiplicity, as mind and change and and variation and all of this, then it's part of the dynamic field of of life, relationships. We are we are compelled into relationships. But before any relationship can begin, you must start with the sense of I. That is the first shaped concept you must have. The sense of I must be there before even the concept of you. You derive its meaning from I in relation to I. Mm -hmm. It's not a word that can live by itself. The sense I must be the primary the primary concept. It's a sense of I, I being, I am, I am. And is this I the, the ego? Not necessarily. I is a shapeshifter. It has a potential to be I as ego because God says I am. 
But the devil also say, I am also. He can say, I am also. He Ego says, so I am. No, no. There are words, but they, the word I has different meaning, connotation, depending on who speaks it. Mm-hmm. When, when Jesus says, I, I am. Hmm? Mm-hmm. I remember a story that uh, he was speaking with uh, some of the the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and Sadducees or whatever whatever they were called from from the Sanhedrin of the time. And he they were arguing with him and he said to tell you the truth. If you knew the truth, the truth would set you free. And they were very upset by him saying that. He says, you know, who are you to speak to us like that? We are children of Abraham. Mm-hmm. As though it was enough to be a child of Abraham, descendant of Abraham, to be entitled to be truth or something. And he said to them, If you were true children of Abraham, you would accept me and the words I speak, because your father Abraham spoke of me. And they said, What are you saying? You are you are a young man, maybe thirty four years old at the time. Mm-hmm. And our father Abraham lived you know centuries ago. What are you saying? You're greater than Abraham or something. And he said, to tell you the truth, before Abraham was born or conceived, I am. So that we says I am in that context is not referring to the ego nor even to the body of Christ but the spirit of truth. All beings have the sense, I am, all sentient beings. I am is not something that your parents taught you, but the sense I am is actually our name. I would say it is our name. Mm -hmm. All beings refer as I, Mm -hmm. I am. The I, for me, symbolizes consciousness. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. I, consciousness, am. Mm -hmm. Am, is. I am, no? But also, the egoic sense also say I. And even the most um, deep delus- delusory state, mm-hmm. people still say I am something. So, it is the first born, it's the first shaped, mm-hmm. the sense I. But when I is identified with body-mind, limited to body-mind and conditioning, it arises as um, egoic individuality. And it's that that has to be transcended somehow. Mm. <coughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about consciousness. Um, if there is consciousness, there must be something to be conscious of. Is there not? Not necessarily. That's the, that's the normal way of thinking about it. I mean, the conversation we are having must necessarily take place in consciousness. Mm-hmm. The functioning of the senses and the perception of the senses and their functioning is itself inside the greater consciousness. There's conscious of and there's consciousness. Conscious of is the dualistic functioning of consciousness. I'm conscious that we are sitting here, you're here, we're wearing uh, you know, this clothes or that clothes, we're sitting in a very bright room. That's conscious of. When consciousness can be aware of consciousness only, then something very different. So would you say that's pure being? Yes, we are pure being, actually. We are the pure being. But because we have been trained, somehow, first of all, to believe that we are just the body, we are the body-mind and our education, our conditioning, Mm -hmm. that's what gives rise to the secondary identity, the I-me as a person, I the person am. The person is an illusory entity, in fact. What we are is the beingness. And how does God fit into all of this? How does all this fit into God? All this fit into God, not God fit into this. <laughs> <laughs> because God is pure consciousness. God is pure consciousness. God is beyond even consciousness, what I would call the field of pure awareness. Everything fits into God. Everything carries the perfume. Everything here you see. When it's cooked down, the DNA of all things you see and the one who sees it is God. I guess I want to bring it to the, back to the practical now. 
Because I guess we've been talking about theoretical things. No, I'm talking about deeply practical things. Mm-hmm. Everything I'm speaking about is the thing as it is. Okay. We may not see that because for me, practicality is only love in action. Mm-hmm. Truth in action is practical. But we can speak in a direct text context of um, practical things. I don't know what you mean, but let's, wait, let's see. Yeah, I guess I'm... I wanted to ask you, how how would you... And I, I know you don't actually know a lot about Course Miracles and the mm-hmm. groups and much mm-hmm. of that philosophy, but I guess I want to bring it back to what is it that can be imparted mm-hmm. to the Course community mm-hmm. to help them go deeper? I would say, actually, first of all, I think in the essence, I know very much about the Course in Miracles. Mm. In the details and the practice and so on, then I, that, that is not, not so important. I mean, only in as much as the practitioners, and practitioners of that Course, mm-hmm. if there is within them an urge or longing to discover truth, mm-hmm. and not merely to discover truth as a practitioner of the Course in Miracles, mm-hmm. because I would see that as a limitation, not the Course in Miracles, or any religious path or any spiritual path. That's fine. But if we are not just dedicated to the costume of our practice, Mm -hmm. but what you're trying to find is the truth and not just the way of living. Yeah. You see? So then that I would make, I would draw some highlight towards that to say, if people are open, because if whatever the Course in Miracles is aiming to impart, and Advaita Vedanta is aiming to impart, general Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, anything is aiming to impart or to to attain, hmm, they are one. Hmm. I would just put it that it's a question more of speed. What does that mean? Speed meaning that something, some parts may be prescribed for you to complete in another lifetime. Mm. I know some like that. Or for a very long time you will practice and then eventually you make it there. So I am just telling you something that is possible today. That would be the difference. Because if you say that truth is infinite, Mm -hmm. timeless, omnipresent, it must be here now. Then a true practitioner or a seeker of truth must want to find that as soon as possible. It's like we are poor, we're living on the street begging for bread. And someone tells you, you know what, your parents have left you this huge sum of money. Mm -hmm. And I ask you, how long do you want to wait to get it? You can have it next year, 10 years' time, when you grow a beard, whatever it is, when you're married, or today. So some people would want to say, well, actually, I want it today. If it's mine this year, I want it today. Where is it? My attitude is more like that. Mm. It's not hurry, but if I'm hungry and the food is thirsty, what is it? I can drink this now. <laughs> this is that, that, no sensible, wise, pragmatic, practical. You use the word, but then it's here. If you say, Well, actually, it's here too now, but you can't get it until next week, I want to know why. I want to know why. Therefore, my attitude is like this. It's easy for me to guide you, if you're open, that is, mm. to discover that truth right now. I can show you. But most people will not be able to stay in that because the, their tendencies are too strong. Mm-hmm. There's still um, unfulfilled desires. Mm-hmm. There's still a loyalty to their thinking and their projections. Mm-hmm. 
all these things will weigh you down. And then you'll feel like, I can't sustain. It will be like asking you to sort of pull yourself up with one hand. So they could go up there, but they couldn't stay, mm-hmm. so to speak. And yet, the truth is effortless. The self is effortless. Mm-hmm. So the trouble is not the truth. The trouble is the person. What the person is, what they conceive themselves to be. And where energetically your life is most stable. Energetically, for most people, life is stable in the, in the, in the mode of a person. That's what they have come to believe. Well, this is where it's at. They will return more to that state where they feel comfortable with just being a person and tomorrow we'll be there. What are we going to do on Thursday? Well, we're going to do this. And they live in that mode. But the truth itself is effortless. And you also essentially are effortless because you and truth are the same thing. So if truth is effortful, we must look at where what what where is the disparity, where is the what, what's gone wrong. Charles reading your biography yesterday and um, um, when when Papaji told you that, you know, for you to really know truth, you have to disappear. Yeah. You got really angry. Yes, yes. And that really resonated with me. Because yes. I, I'm really scared. Mm. I wasn't scared. It wasn't that I was scared. For myself, what happened was that it wasn't like, oh, I'm angry for you for saying that. It was like something deeper down. It was like an old anger. It was like, it, it was an unexpected anger. I have no reason to be angry at Papaji, mm. but something was angry. It was like my devil was angry. You understand? Something inside just got caught. Some place where I was hiding, that was still left, something that was still surviving in the dark, in the blind spot of my own seeing, was just caught, mm-hmm. just by his presence even. And it started to... <laughs> and it became so loud inside, so loud, that I was looking at him and I couldn't actually physically hear what he was saying. You know? <laughs> inside my head. Feeling all this rage and it was coming like, oh, you know, you have insulted me and... You have exposed me in front of all these people who have become your joke, you know, you're not my master, who do you think you are? It's all this rubbish, you know, but it was very strong. And I just wanted to escape mm. to another planet, actually. There was one guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I left that place very, very, ah. I knew I was waiting for this. I told myself I'm, I was waiting for this because this is what I needed to really leave this place. It was enough. Mm. This place where Papa Joe lived was called is called luck now, luck now. Mm-hmm. But for me, my it was bad luck, bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, I'm going. That's what happened. But it turned out beautifully because I went home. I was very determined to pass out of packing my bags to leave. And it was a very hot day. And I felt to go for a walk. I went out into the local center of the town sat under a tree, fuming. The energy of rage, anger was still inside me. Mm. And then somebody came and said hello, who was also in Satsa. And then I felt, okay, fine. I go back, pack the clothes and go. And I walked off. And after, you know, maybe 30 meters or so, just this cloud I was walking in just vanished. Mm. And it's like everything vanished. Also my identity vanished. Mm-hmm. I could not find myself. I'm just reminded of the story of Mara and, and the Buddha. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mara being the demon that came up during when Buddha was, I think, was the last thing that he mm-hmm. faced before his enlightenment. It just feels to me like something similar. I think it goes true for many people like this. It was also in Christ also, he was driven to the wilderness yeah. and uh, after the baptism. And all that was left inside that needed to be brought out, this, the devil manifested 
Where did the devil come from? Where did the devil come from? In the big wilderness, where he come from? Out of the potential of Christ he come. The devil's not living in the wilderness. Hmm. To then put in front of him the remnants of what could catch his mind. And he had to overcome that. He had to transcend that mm, temptations. You cannot be tempted unless you are temptable. That is the greatness of Christ, actually. The greatness of anyone is that what you are is greater than your mind. Mm. But you must remember and be one with that. It's only because we forget our true nature while mind has such power. Because the mind cannot exist without you, but you can exist without the mind. Mm. The psychological neurotic mind I'm talking about. The functioning mind is fine. It doesn't leave a bad spell. But the neurotic um, psychological devious mind you have to transcend. Mm. That's what keeps us in the state of duality, negative duality, mm -hmm. limitation, fear, all these things. And that we as consciousness trust our mind. Or maybe you even don't trust it even. But you have a relationship with it. And because you still give value to it mm -hmm. in that way, rather than giving value to yourself. Hmm. I guess I, I struggle with that. Because I guess some part of me still feels that the mind has a use. It, to me, the concept of spirit being the master and the mind being the servant is important. But here it feels like what we're saying is the mind has to be completely let go of. The mind itself is the self. Mind also emerge out of the, the pure. Mm -hmm. But when the pure imagines itself to be the mind and the body, mind becomes a deceiver. It role becomes that. It role comes to test you because you have descended, actually, into a grosser realm. From, from the state of pure consciousness, we believe ourselves to be the body-mind, and conditioning, which itself is the, it is the fall. Mm. You understand? Mm. Because the mind, this neurotic mind, cannot intimidate the pure self. Mm. It can only intimidate the idea we have of who we are. So it's that aspect of the mind that must be transcended. Surprisingly, when it is transcended, meaning its influence is transcended, it changes sides and becomes your servant. But not before. The man is not your friend, not yet. As long as we have the sense that I'm this person, this is me, this is my life, I'm going here, I'm going there, I do what I want, the mind will ride your back. The mind is not here to be a servant of the ego. And when you don't know yourself, we are functioning as the ego. The mind is here to frustrate the ego. That is the glorious role of the mind. The mind is here to frustrate the ego. Yes. I'm talking about in a spiritual sense now. I'm not talking about mind as the ability to create all these beautiful buildings and to create, you know, that's also mind. It's also mind. It's also the self. Mind is also the self. Mind is consciousness. Mind is God also. Right. But when God changes in a way to become sort of like to play as a person, then mind also comes down also to play. You see? As that which is in conflict with the person. Playing like a friend, and you know, it's like that. Mm -hmm. Like the mind will tell you, you know, this person is walking with a limp and you're with your friends, you know, make a joke of this guy, make a joke of the guy. And he goes, oh yeah, you know, hello, limpy. And everybody goes, ha 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 ha. And then the guy is really hurt. And then the mind itself says, you shouldn't have done that. Mm. 
You understand? It plays both plays with you. Right. And it is deeply linked to our sense of who we are. It, when you become clean, mind becomes clean. Mm -hmm. But it will not go to the door before you. Bringing it to the level of a global consciousness. In what I've seen, in what I think is happening on this planet, mm -hmm. is that there is huge change. At least, I mean, change is happening all the time, but there is a period that it really feels like the earth on, and humanity is waking up to the nature of themselves as one being. Would you comment on the current times? I don't believe it's true. I'm sorry. I want to believe it's true. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it is true. I believe that more and more with the, with the facilities such as like, you know, the World Wide Web or something like this yep. has a tremendous role to play in the potential for making available and accessible the wisdom of the self. But internet doesn't work for the internet. It works for the mind of men. So if it is used in a beautiful way, it's used in many different ways, no? Mm -hmm. It's also used for very corrupt ways, but it also has a potential to be used for beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. And now these days, for those whose inclination or their temperament is oriented towards spiritual discovery, internet is also facilitating this wow. also, no? And... Uh, I would say some of what we are sharing today you would not be able to get on the internet. You would not have been able to do, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You'd have to go to some place like Tibet or India or some place and, you know, traditionally it would take 12 years living in the presence of a master you know, before you have imbibed enough, absorbed enough to wash the mind clean uh, or to realize yourself. What now is everything becomes more accessible, mm -hmm. which is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the proportion of people has changed, that larger numbers because of this would change. I think there's a lot of people who for, who, for them, spirituality is still a kind of novelty. Mm. It's not yet a portal to truth, to real truth, mm. to conceptual, intellectual grasping or conviction of truth, yes, but to themselves discover that they are the living embodiment of the truth. I don't know how many people like that. It would be great that more and more come into that understanding. And I cannot give numbers, I don't think anybody can give numbers. But it is not enough, I have to say, to simply have, have a, a concept of what truth is, to even believe that this is true, to have beautiful feelings that arise out of at least the opening up of the mind and the consciousness. And that, that is also good. But to be the truth, not be as an action taken, but be as a realization, as an understanding that is established so profoundly that it replaces the ego. I think it's rare. So you don't buy into this concept of acceleration? It may well be, and everything I'm doing is to accelerate that. Mm -hmm. And other beings, wonderful masters in the world are doing it. Mm -hmm. They try, but they are compelled to. But I don't want to, because it's not the first time. In my age, more than you, I would have seen it two or three times, where this global fantasy that, oh, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. The world likes this kind of thing now and again. But it never goes the way that we project. 
and we will never have an accurate reading of what really is. Nobody, not, not, not even a Nostradamus can tell you these things. And it's better that we don't think we know. Because what we think we know, we completely ruin, in fact. The life is best lived in its natural speed of unfolding. The human mind is all into projecting. It wants to bet on it. Even you put the bookies will start to open up shop about uh, betting about it. But the day when we'll stop betting, <laughs> you understand? The mind cannot help it. I just don't want to. I don't see any need, any greatness, any truth, in trying to create any spiritual fantasy. Okay. Why not find out what can be found out now? This is what, but what I want to be saying to people. What can you find out today? Because if it takes you 50 years to discover the truth, and that day will be a Wednesday, it will not be a day unlike this moment. I don't see what difference it would make on that moment that you discover. Of course, you can say, you will be by that time you'll be ready, and that is true. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't not want to force ripen something. Mm -hmm. The truth intact, perfect as it is, is here now. But the person we have become may not be ready to embrace that. So what about destiny? Hmm. It's one of God's beautiful concepts. There's no destiny for the pure self. The destiny only for the body, mind, identity. Hmm. Hmm. It is also a concept. We can talk about this, but in the end, it will not help you to discover the truth, except that we don't become obsessed about these things. <clears throat> More important that someone tries to find out what is really true and really who really am I, that which dwells in this body to realize the full potential of it, not the partial understanding, but to discover and be that. Mm -hmm. mm. It just feels so confusing sometimes. It's, it's like the, the mind is the, both the canvas and the, and the instrument. And for me, it's just, I, I, I follow what the cause calls the Holy Spirit mm. and I, in a sense, surrender to that higher power because I really feel like it's just hard to, to navigate this, this maze, this infinite maze yeah. without... I want to tell you, you don't have to navigate. You have a small role to play. This is the beauty of this understanding. Nobody can figure out this mighty universe. But the one who knows the self knows it spontaneously. The mind is a very unstable realm. Most unstable. Therefore, to plan your route through it, the waters will always be changing. There's a higher way, a purer, more direct way. Much, much, much more. I would not tell anybody, go and study your mind, except a little bit. Understand a little bit how it is. If I understood this, what this is, then I can understand what everything else in this universe is. I don't have to understand this thing, and this thing, and this thing, and this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. I don't understand any of this. Nobody can understand it. All that you see, all that you consider to be yourself, is the product and the content of the waking state. In deep sleep you have no cognition, no perception, no identity, no belief, no religion, no I. And we enter this state with 
pure grace and surrender. Every human being, even atheists, Buddhists, all go to the same state. And we love to be in this state where nothing is, not even I is there. But something is here. Something is there. That we really are there. But it itself is not sleep. And when the waking state arises again, then the I again emerges, and when the I again emerge and becomes the me, then the you emerge, and then time emerges, and then other emerge, and then world emerge, job emerge, relationship emerge, belief emerge, all these things emerge. We are we are also actors inside the waking state and witnesses of it at the same time. If I can get people to come to that place where they transcend the person and become the presence, that would be already a good start. But a lot of resistance is there to move the person into presence. Presence is the sense that I am, the intuitive sense of being. When that is not identified with any other concept or intention, The perfume arising out of that isolation is peace and joy, light, love, fearlessness. It is the godly state, the godly principle, in form, in manifestation. But there is a stage beyond this one, and I don't want to talk about it, until one comes at least to that state the state I am, the unmixed state of I am, not contaminated with identity and memory and projections, attachments and so on. Because these uh, energies, they stifle the spontaneity of being, when we identify ourselves as merely a person. It is a severe limitation of consciousness. The person is also consciousness. But it is a limited expression of consciousness. On every level of consciousness, even on the very limited level of consciousness, there is joy and there is affinity there. This is why the beings can stay there for quite a long time. Because the juice of consciousness is there and the vital force. Sometimes I wonder if it was not there or if it was only a dew drop of it there, the aspiration would be greater to come out of it. Because even demons enjoy their existence. What about freedom? Is is freedom then an impulse? <coughs> is freedom then a what? Is freedom then an impulse, uh, almost like a force to for the self? While we are in the dreaming state, freedom, the impulse, the concept of freedom, uh, must come, because it becomes the mm, uh, it becomes the driving force that is necessary yeah. in order to to leave the state of bo bondage mm -hmm. to the body. There must be the aspiration for freedom. Ultimately, even this aspiration will fall away. Hmm. Mm. Hmm. Because freedom is natural to us, it's our natural, it's our natural state, mm. awakened state, when we are free from the mm, hypnosis of conditioning and identity. Mm. But while we have that identity, then the aspiration for freedom must be there. Otherwise, a human being is as good as dead, without aspiration. For a while, the aspiration for freedom takes on puts on different garments. It could be an aspiration to succeed in life, to get married and so on. It's all aspiration for freedom, for liberation, when the being cannot see that directly. It will try and portray freedom through a relationship or through... You understand? 
through healthy living or something like this because it cannot embrace the pureness of this uh, freedom beyond even the concept of freedom. It is not. We don't realize that that is our self. Is that that your self is love? Your self is freedom. Your self is joy. Your self is infinite. Mm-hmm. To a human being, they are confused to hear these terms. What you? What the hell are you talking about? You know, my life is just uh, from day to day. I'm living from hand to mouth. They cannot understand that yet. And yet, that is the the deepest truth. But do you not think then? The human being attaches all these things to itself in order to experience that letting go. I say myself that consciousness creates a problem in order to experience transcending it. Yeah. Not the human being. The human being itself okay. is the expression of consciousness. The human being is not the controller mm-hmm. of consciousness. Mm-hmm. We are ourselves the portrait of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Do you think this happens with all beings, like animals and plants and minerals and yeah, everything, 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 even a bit of snot is the expression of consciousness. So everything is alive. Even the inanimate objects are alive mm. because they are they are expressions of consciousness. But we don't need to know that, you understand? We don't need to know that. <laughs> if truth is what you're seeking, actually, we don't need to... We are having fun, actually. I'm talking about these things. It is truth also. It is uh, truthful. Yeah. Yes. But there can be a fascination about these things for some mm. people. I say that what I'm speaking now comes naturally mm. Mm, as waves of illumination that come when the mind is being set free from the stranglehold of identity then all these things, you come to know about them spontaneously. Mm. I don't see that they are the most important. For me, teaching is not the most important thing. Discovery is the most important thing. Yes, you mentioned that to me, Mm. um, that you are not a teacher, but you just seek to facilitate discovery. You don't put it like that. I would. Okay. (laughs) Tell us about that. I think that... uh, our culture as a human being is to learn something. Yes. Yeah? But in spite of learning, what we produce is just mostly mm, concrete things. It has an objective, concrete expression. About ourselves, we know very little. We learn about everything else, but about ourselves, we know very little. When human beings study themselves, they call it, I don't know, psychology, philosophy, or something. But these are just concepts. Real learning or discovering about oneself does not lead to philosophy. It leads to liberation. Liberation is when a human being has really fulfilled their opportunity in this existence. They've come back to their original self where they are naturally happy, naturally at peace, naturally compassionate, naturally knowing the unity of all things, beyond merely intellectual conviction. And is that enlightenment? We can call it enlightenment. Enlightenment would mean only to realize what you have always been. And that you don't become. Therefore I say, you don't need to be creative, don't use imagination. Mm-hmm. You don't need knowledge. You don't even need study. Mm-hmm. If truth is what you're seeking. If knowledge is what you're seeking, then you need all these things. You have to study all these things, compare all these things. But it will not necessarily lead you to liberation. It might lead you to superego, to pride. So you would say enlightenment is a shift rather than a process. I think everything you do with a genuine search for truth take you nearer to to that state. I would call it grace picks you up more than you pick you up. 
you are carried by the wind of grace. Grace is another name for what we are also. Mm-hmm. Rarely is a human being single-minded enough to attain freedom. We are so invested in duality. It is grace that puts you prepare whatever it requires to transcend the influence of the mind, to drop the identity. I don't even want to say drop the identity is the most important, more to discover what is true, mm. rather than to fight off what is untrue. <coughs> hmm. That's interesting, because uh, I guess I've always seen it as a a process of negation. I am not this, I am not this. But what you're saying, is that different from... I am not this is an ancient way. I am not this, I am not, I'm not this, I am not... It's depending again on how genuine is and how urgent your search is. You can say, I am not this finger, I am not the ring. I am not this finger either. I am not the finger now. Then it would be the mind who will be doing that. Because if it does it like this, it's going to take hundreds of years to go through this universe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that. But if it says, well, if I'm not the hand, I'm not this body, the tree is also a body. I cannot be anything with a body. I'm looking at my hand. My hand is not looking at me. I'm looking at this world. What is this earth. But the world is a different place. And all things are comprised, composed out of the five elements. I am the weakness of the five elements and their combinations. Mm. So they are phenomena for me. They are images inside consciousness. I cannot be that. So in two scoops, we have completed the entire universe then. Rather than saying, I'm not the grass, I'm not the clouds. and This is buying time for the mind. Well, I guess you see a, a certain section of that illusion, don't you? I mean, it's like if something comes up in me, mm. then I'm present with that, and I say I'm not that. Mm. It's not like I mean the way I well, see it. Well, it's not just to say I'm not that; it's to see I'm not that. Not just to say I'm not that; it's to see. But I mean, I am the witness of the arising of something, the sense of its presence and its departure. So obviously, I cannot be that because when it departs, if I was that, I'd also be gone. It's very practical, very matter of factual. Anything I see also, it appears inside. And when it appears, in that moment it is seen. I was here before the appearance of this. Now this is here. I am the witness of it. And I am the witness of the, that it's not here anymore. So it cannot be what I am. It cannot be the seer of it. And everything is appearing like this, including belief, personality also. I'm watching the breath. Is the breath watching me? No idea. No, you must know this thing. The the watching must be coming from here. The center of the watching was coming from here. Of the earth and the world. The earth is one. We are living, there's one earth, but there are millions, billions of worlds. The worlds is only what you, what is shaped, your picture of the earth and your place in it and your interest and your projections and your dream superimposed upon the innocent earth, make it your world. And each being has their own take on the world. We can 